So today we will be talking about transfer pricing methods in Malaysia. Welcome everyone to our uh, webinar for today. Before we get started, let me just do a one minute introduction about our firm. I see some familiar names in our attendees today, but for those of you who don't know us, we our firm specializes in transfer pricing advisory services. We pride ourselves from being practical, proactive, and cost-effective in advising multinational groups with their transfer pricing issues and risk. Uh, we have uh, three offices. Our head office located in Australia, uh, our two offices in Asia, which is our office in Singapore and uh, Malaysia. We are also very proud to be considered a tier two transfer pricing firm. And we also regularly contribute to industry leadership uh, journals, such as the Institute of Chartered Accountancy of Singapore Journals and being uh, award winners of uh, Asia Newcomer, Asia Transfer Pricing Firm uh, Leader of the Year and Australia Transfer Pricing Firm of the Year. Uh, with that, let me introduce uh, for those of you who don't know us yet at our uh, panelists for today, we have first Hon Chuan Tan, who is the Director of Transfer Pricing Solutions Malaysia with over 10 years of, of experience in transfer pricing and a pioneer in developing transfer pricing practices, initially setting up uh, the practice for a mid-tier firm in Malaysia. Now we're lucky enough to have him in our team. Um, he is very passionate about transfer pricing and love helping uh, his clients and going the extra mile to resolving their transfer pricing issues. And we have also today Kevin Tai, who is our senior manager with uh, about nine years of experience with transfer pricing advisory in Australia, Asia, and um, uh, Malaysia. And basically what I can say about Kevin Tai about being also passionate about transfer pricing is he loves uh, researching and dealing with technical issues that are complex to make it simple for his clients. And myself, um, which will be the moderator for today, my name is Adriana Calderon, and the co-founder of Transfer Pricing Solutions Asia and Malaysia with more than 15 years of experience in transfer pricing and international tax advisory. Uh, prior to being the lead partner in transfer pricing solutions, I work with big four and mid-tier firms uh, in advisory tax, international tax and transfer pricing. Uh, and with that, I am more than happy to jump into our topic for today. So transfer pricing methods. So let me start by talking a little bit and setting up the scene before Hon Chuan and Kevin start talking about the details on how to apply and when to select a particular method over another. So the transfer pricing methods are essentially uh, five that are worldwide recognized uh, by most tax authorities in the world that follow the OECD. The reason being that the transfer pricing methods were born uh, at OECD level, and they were basically adopted from uh, the pioneer country that has uh, implemented transfer pricing, which is the US. We have generally uh, five methods, but those five methods can be grouped in two different categories or groups. One will be the transactional traditional methods, which is the comparable and control price method, the resale price method, and the cost plus. And we have also the transactional profit methods, which is basically the profit split and the TNMM. In theory, uh, there is options to uh, essentially uh, being able to apply other methods. Nevertheless, in practice, uh, almost, I will say 95% of the times you are able to apply one of the five methods worldwide accepted. Um, with that, I'm going to delay in the, in the, in the, in the presentation. Uh, with that, let me pass the button to um, 
Hon Chuan, and it would be great if you could give us a little bit of input on what are the key considerations that we need to take into account when selecting a transfer pricing method in uh, Malaysia. Right. Um, thanks, Diviana. So selection of methods. Um, his, well, let's go down history. Historically, there was a hierarchy amongst the five methods that you see earlier um, in the OECD DP guidelines. Uh, and at a point in time, the, the cup method was actually the king of all methods, though not used a lot of times, but it's preferred. Um, then of course, the remaining two traditional methods, your visual price and your cost plus, and after which then we can use the transactional profit method, which is the profit split, or mainly your transactional net margin method, TNMM. Um, since then, um, the OECD has actually changed um, how it looks at um, transfer pricing methods. Um, it went from a hierarchy approach to, a, to the most appropriate method, where each method uh, each method has, are deemed to have its own merit, right? So each method should be looked at um, independently. Um, and then from there, you choose the most appropriate method. But on the other hand, um, for the Malaysian TP guidelines, um, it's still under the old approach where the RRB advises that transactional profit methods should and only should be used when the traditional transactional methods cannot be reliably applied or exceptionally applied at all. So which means that you still have to go through your cup, you still have to go through your um, resale price cup, but then only then you can only use the DNM method, right? So the reason being is that it provides a more direct comparison with independent party transactions, right? So there you go. Um, Legion is still um, on the latter approach, former approach. Having said that, um, when you look at selection of TP method, you still need to go through other considerations, right? Such as the strength and weaknesses of each method for your acceptance or rejection of that particular method, and then you also need to look at your the type of or the nature of the transaction, the degree of comparability, and of course, lastly, the availability on the reliable the keywords reliable here reliable data. Right, these are the approaches that you should take um, when you're selecting your transfer pricing method in Malaysia. Excellent, and um, HC, and let's then before we start going through each of the five methods and what they are and how they apply, why don't um, like Kevin, why don't you give us a little bit of uh, information and background on what is called comparability analysis? Because I guess regardless of the transfer pricing method that uh, is going to be ap applied, there is something that is important and is uh, making sure that the tested transaction or controlled transaction and independent transaction are compatible. So maybe if you could help us to elaborate what these comparability factors are and why are they important? Sure, Adriana. Um, look, compar comparability analysis is a crucial part of transfer pricing analysis. No matter what transfer pricing method you use, you will, you will be dealing with comparability met, uh, analysis one point at a time, right? Um, and the reason for this is because if you look at what is the ultimate goal of transfer pricing, it's just basically proving whatever you're doing is similar to what the market is doing if they're operating independently. So to do that, you need a point of reference. Um, how, and, and, and before you sort of conclude which point of reference you are using, you need to make sure whatever reference you are doing is comparable or is similar to your company or your circumstances that then then you can provide a, a sort of like a, a understandable data or meaningful data for you to do your analysis so in terms of comparability analysis the OECD and the Malaysian guidelines actually accepted uh, highlighted five key factors that you need to look at when you're doing your transfer price analysis doesn't matter what method you are using. One of it is the characteristic of property and services. Now, this generally deals with 
whether or not the reference you are using is uh, is involved in the same property or services that you are providing or that you are selling. Okay. Second point: functions perform asset utilize and risk assume this is basically your functional profile this is your business profile what you are operating as are you a distributor or are you a manufacturer obviously we don't compare a manufacturer to a distributor because they have a very different profile and then obviously contractual term particularly if you are using the traditional method this is very re re uh, relevant because a traditional method they have a very strict or very high level of comparability requirement for you to apply that method reliably. So contractual term can often affect the pricing. It may not have that big of an impact on the overall return when you go into a transactional method, but when you're looking at the pricing, it's your, your, your top line revenue, contractual term can, can be a huge impact. So that's why the contractual term is also important here. And then obviously business strategy, um, some companies, they can be, un, uh, you know, in a uh, applying a different business strategy than others, or they can be in different um, uh, plan uh, project they are involved in. So you need to make sure that whatever you are comparing to all your reference point would have more or less similar business strategy. Um, obviously, if that cannot be determined, then you need to consider whether or not you need to use a more flexible transfer pricing method in terms of the comparability um, of this of this uh, particular category. And then lastly, obviously, you have your economic circumstances. This generally look at your market conditions that you're operating in. Uh, for example, you don't compare yourself maybe in, in US with, uh, with a company in Malaysia because more likely they are in a very different market uh, situation, um, different maturity of the market then again, that will impact your analysis. So these are the comparability analysis, whatever you do, when you look for reference point, these are the factors that you need to look at. Thanks, Kevin. And I guess um, just to add on it, uh, the, the, the reason why they're important is because they can affect the price in a transaction. And that's why uh, it's kind of understood this comments again from OECD that uh, these factors, can be sensitive or uh, sensitive towards price, and therefore uh, they have to be addressed in order to be able to say that a market price is comparable to a control price. Um, with that, uh, let's start first with the uh, comparable uncontrolled price. So we're going to start first with the traditional transactional methods, which they essentially um, endeavor to test either a price or a gross margin, and we will see how it can be applied. So let's start with the comparable and controlled price. Um, yeah, the first is cup. We call it the cup method. As the name suggests, if you look at comparable, it's a comparison of price between uncontrolled, meaning um, your third party pricing, so uncontrolled there, against that of your related pricing. Right, so the keyword is um, uncontrolled the price part, right? As I mentioned earlier, the cup method is very much preferred by the RIB when it can be reliably applied. So it's actually very important that you get your assessment accurate if you are actually rejecting the cup method before using the other method, right? Now, the key difference between the cup and the other two traditional methods is the cup compares the actual price of the product or services, while the resale price or your cost plus, they compare the gross margin uh, percentage of the product or services. Right? That's the key difference. Right? There are pros and cons for each method. For, for CUP, as um, Kevin mentioned, um, on the comparability analysis, five factors, you have to go through each, uh, particularly the products or services characteristics, where you know, the products need to be more or less identical for you to actually apply cup, right? I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, a blue pen versus a red pen is actually not identical. For you, maybe it is a pen, but the color itself, right, may impact the pricing, right? Blue pen, as you know, will generally be used more than a red pen, for example, 
So the pricing for both may be different. Um, on top of the characteristics, you have to have similar contractual terms. You know, when you look at you know, your freight arrangements, your, your volumes and your discounts, all this needs to be taken into account. And lastly, you know, economic and market conditions. As Kevin has mentioned earlier, where different geographic locations may have different kind of pricing. So that's very important for CUP. So it's very much preferred by the RRB, but it's very difficult to apply due to its high level of comparability requirements, right? So I've got to the um, theory on this. Maybe let's illustrate this in a scenario, sort of a perfect scenario or simple example on the next slide, where we can show you how to actually apply, right? Here, we are showing a simple scenario where cup can be applied both externally or internally. On the internal scenario, which is the first part, you have um, company A selling products to both A related party and as a party. Here, you have the internal data, which is the price sold to company B that can be used as an internal cup against your price to company C. Right. Now, what happens if you do not have that internal data, which means you actually sell directly to your real party? Another scenario where if it can be reliably applied and obtained, then you can actually obtain external data that is directly comparable to the products that you sell and apply that external price against the price that you sold to your related party. All right. So the KVN is really reliable data, right? You have to make sure that you have reliable information to be applied, you know, both internal and external, right? Regardless of whether you use internal or external, same thing, you have to go through the comparability analysis before applying any method whatsoever, right? Yeah, that's correct. I think one key here also in Hong Chan is the fact that the cup method, the price can be quite sensitive towards um, any differentiation, like in your example, the blue pen and the red pen, um, also the raw materials. So if the red pen is red and the inputs are different and the blue pen has another set of inputs that makes the ink blue, the chances are that if there is a price difference to the customer and therefore there could be a, it could be a struggle to compare the price of the blue pen versus the red pen. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's mainly because any product is priced on its cost of manufacturing or creating, plus a profit for whoever sells to the end customer. And uh, the difference in products or service can alter that basic cost and therefore alter that basic end price, which is why, for example, in the example that you're looking here, which is fertilizers, uh, if you have a situation like this, you have a fertilizer that is being sold to company B and company C, one could expect that the fertilizer is the same because the price is fine. But if the fertilizer all of the sudden is based one on chemicals and the other one is organic, mm. then that could bring straight away a sensi a, 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 an effect in the price that will make it not comparable, which yeah. is why it's so, um, I have another example, which is with chocolate preparations. I remember um, a case um, that I did many years ago where the chocolate preparation when it's white is made out of sugar and milk. When it's black, is made out of cocoa and milk. And the cocoa price is different to the sugar price. So therefore, if in this scenario that I'm saying, the uh, related party was uh, selling to uh, white chocolate and to the third party, uh, black chocolate. So unless you can do reliable adjustments, that price is not comparable. So in your case, maybe red pen to a related party, blue pen uh, to a third party. So that's the, the challenge of the COP method basically as well. 
Kevin, do you have any comments? Yeah, I think that's, that, that makes perfect sense. It's because, um, yeah, the cup requires such a, almost like an apple to apple comparison. Uh, it's often very hard to uh, apply, but although there are certain transactions that you will see a lot of cup application, uh, simply because, you know, there are data, a lot of data available publicly that you can use, but otherwise in terms of products, it's generally quite hard, especially you you want a uh, external publicly available data as quite a challenge because most often these are all trade secrets that company usually will not share publicly. Correct. All right, AC, let's go now with the second transactional, um, traditional transactional mm -hmm. method, which is the resale price. Resale price in comparison with cup. So resale price method focuses more on function analysis profile than the product comparability. Right. The, the resale price method is used generally used for distributors where you can um, get when you are actually comparing the gross margin of the product sold, and it's more appropriate when there is no substantial value added to the products by the reseller, meaning the reseller is merely you know, reselling the product without modification or additional packaging or that the reseller in your supply chain, they don't, they don't actually contribute significantly to the value creation within your supply chain, so to speak. Um, hence, where the real party and the party, party transactions are comparable in all aspects, Accept the product itself. The resale price method may be more reliable than the cup method. So the difference is, you know, as I mentioned earlier, is price versus uh, gross margin, right? But having said that, now that we are in the um, COVID pandemic, which is the important word here, the comparability will be more restrictive. Now that previously we say we have product, product may not be a factor. Now that yet we may have two broad categories, those that are impacted by COVID versus those that are benefited by COVID. Right. So you can use um as what you used previously to the same concept now that we are in a COVID pandemic. But nonetheless, um the more comparable to products, the more likely the resale price method will produce a much better result. Right. So that's the that's key thing for resale price. Now, let's look at the examples to apply the resale price method. Yeah. All right. If you look at example here, the goal of the resale price method is actually to test the resale price margin of the reseller. So in this example, we look at the resale party reseller buys from the reseller party supplier at $85 and on started to a third party at uh, $100, thereby earning you a resale margin of a 15%. Now, the goal is to test this 15% resale margin earned. And obviously, the, this test can be done with internal or external comparable data. Internal resale price, meaning if you have a reseller, a reseller buying from a third party supplier, then you can use that as a basis to compare against your 15%. Or if internal data is not available. External data can be obtained through a benchmarking only, again, when the data is reliable and can be reliably applied for this method itself, right? Yeah, that's mm -hmm. uh, fine. I guess the, the key here is, as the name says, uh, is the resale price is a prime candidate for a uh, reseller situation where the entity in the supply chain is intermediary in, or intermediary entity between the supplier and the end customer. Maybe in those scenarios, depending on the facts, the reseller price uh, could be applicable. Uh, and the goal would be just to test the resale price margin. And similar to COP, you can have also internal or external. Mm. So with that, um, Hong Chuan, maybe right. let's go through the last of the trans additional transactional methods, which is the cost plus method. Yeah. Actually, it's very similar. Um, 
cost plus also compares at gross level where you analyze the gross markup and cost base for both related party and independent party transactions. Right? In applying the cost plus, now we saw the poll is about 34%. Um, obviously, I'm not sure whether that method was applied um, accurately. Not to say it's not accurate, but um, sometimes it may be confused with your net cost plus where you're actually looking at net, which is actually PNMM. But in applying the cost plus method here, direct and indirect cost of producing a of good and producing that service are normally used to compute the cost base. And such costs are actually limited to the cost of the supply of the goods or services and should take into account an analysis of the supplier's functional analysis. Now, the cost plus method is generally applied for um, scenarios where you have semi-finished goods so between related parties, joint facility, or you have your long-term buy and sell arrangements, uh, whether you are subcontractors or not. And obviously, if you are a service provider, that can be used as well for cost plus. Okay. Um, yeah. Let's well, go through that. Maybe let's go through an example. Yeah. So here, you have a scenario where company A is a contract manufacturer of spare parts. It sells to both spare parties B and C, and company A actually earns a 42% cost plus margin based on that. Um, and same thing with resale price. The goal is actually to test this 42% um, cost plus margin. And similarly, this test can be done with internal and external comparable data. Now, we are looking at a gross level, not the net level. So the 42% is actually the gross part cost plus margin. And then similarly, internal cost plus margin if internal data is available, if not external reliable data through a benchmarking. Yeah, I think uh, one comment here is that uh, the cost plus just history. Uh, the cost plus, because it helps to understand why, the cost plus uh, has been the traditional way in which manufacturers price their products. And that's how it has been uh, coming into place. Because any manufacturer or contract manufacturer or however you want to call it, uh, in substance, they are looking if you are doing a um, uh, manufacturing that doesn't involve you know, a, a, a lot of intellectual property, et cetera. The traditional way in which you will price the cost of your uh, products is the cost of production, including raw materials, inputs, overheads, et cetera, plus a profit that you need to earn for conducting the business, conducting the business. So that's, that's why a lot of the times the traditional or any manufacturer will be looking at this as an internal price. A different story is how you test it from TP point of view, but that's how this method was born basically. Now we use it for different ways in TP, which I'm not gonna go into detail, but that's basically the history behind it. Um, so with that, maybe let's start talking about uh, the trans traditional profit methods. And I, I need to make a history point here <laughs> before you start caring, which yep, is sure. the point about the profit method and why they were born. Um, the reason why they were born essentially was because uh, historically the three methods, the cup, the, the resale price and the cost plus method, were the original traditional transfer pricing methods in the 1990s in the US. But after a few reviews by the IRS, they realized that there was a lot of operating expenses that taxpayers were bearing that were being paid to related party companies. And as a result, being used as a mechanism for aggressive profit shifting. And therefore they found a fault in the um, traditional transactional methods, which was that it never took into consideration any expenses that are below the gross profit line. As a result of that, the IRS actually, an economist from Brazil, 
invented the TNMM and the profit split as a way to resolve the issue of not considering the operating expenses into the equation when um, setting up or applying, uh, setting up prices in transfer pricing work. So with that, I pass it on to you uh, for the traditional profit methods. All right. Thanks. Thanks for the brief history, um, Adriana. I, I think that's an interesting fact. Like, obviously, transactional profit method uh, is focused on overall profitability of the company or of the of the testing result. Um, if you if you are to put look at it like that, the traditional method is more like a top down approach. Transactional is more like a bottom up approach. We look at the bottom uh, net profit and then work yourself work ourselves up. Whereas the traditional, we look at the pricing and then we work ourselves down. Okay, so under the transactional transactional profit method, you have two gen uh, two commonly accepted one, which is the profit split method, and obviously the more familiar one will be the transactional net margin method or the TNMM. Um, sometimes people may ask, when do we use transactional profit method and when do we use traditional method? All right. Um, answer is simple if we can't use traditional method we use transactional method because even the Malaysian transfer pricing guideline have a preference for traditional method as HG has already uh, has already highlighted earlier simply because traditional method is always a very uh, the, the most direct approach you test the price itself uh, whereas tra transactional as I said you trust the overall outcome of the price um, so, but in practice, things doesn't always happen our way. There are a lot of limitation in terms of applying a traditional method. You could have insufficient reliable data um, to do your compar comparability analysis. You would have, pot pot potentially you would have a product or services that are very unique or you have a very unique intangible that because of the unique nature of this product, you can't get a very reliable comparison for you to apply the traditional method. Or you are the transactions that you are in is very complex. Uh, take for example, you have multiple parties working together, very integrated to produce a product. Let's say for example, you have multiple parties, related parties coming together in the project to develop these products for sale. Then it will be very hard to delineate each, uh, uh, each, each functions performed by each companies and, and, and do, do it through a traditional method. Now, this will more more appropriate for the profit split method, which we will go into now um, to talk about what is the profit split method um, and what is the goal of public profit split method. Like the name says, basically it's just trying to allocate or split a profit arising from a, a particular product or transactions to uh, the parties they are involved, for example, uh, and this generally requires a certain, uh, applies in a very specific situation. For example, um, to name a few, like I said earlier, you have a very high integrated transactions. You have a multiple uh, related parties or parties coming together in a project, all contributed, uh, valuable, uh, all have valuable contribution to create to the creation of this product and and it generated a very unique intangibles. That's why you can't test it into traditional product, uh, traditional approach. We are doing it through a profit split. And obviously functions, contributions, it goes hand in hand with risk assumptions, uh, where these parties have all contributed or took up, took up some sort of economical risk. They are quite significant and you can't really separate that out that's where you do a profit split. Um, in practice, there are two very common uh, analysis that we perform for profit split, which is the residual analysis and the contribution analysis. Now we will go through both um, analysis um, just on a high level because this uh, profit split can be a very complex um, method to apply and it can take a lot, a lot of time to do it right. Um, so we will not go into the technical of it, but on the high level, we will, keep, we will let you know the conceptually how it works. So if we look at the residual analysis, 
what this does is they, you, we look into this project that all of, uh, all of the parties are working on. We try to identify what we call the routine services or the routine functions that contributed to this uh, project where you have your, for example, from creation to sales to after sales, you have your R&D, you have your procurement that supports the manufacturer, and then you have your distributor that distribute the products, and then you have your call center, which is your after sales. These are all what we call a very routine functions that you can identify and segment up and do a analysis to to remunerate them on an arm's length basis. Whatever, after paying all these routine functions, whatever you have left is your residual profit from the project. And then that residual profit will then be split among the entrepreneurs, the one that give valuable contribution to the project, the one that bear the economic risk, the significant economic risk to the project. And you split it among the entrepreneurs. And that is how the residual analysis work conceptually. Then you have your contribution analysis. This is quite similar to uh, your, uh, what do you call that again? <laughs> Residual analysis. Uh, but the only difference is you don't, you don't straight away, you don't go and uh, identify all the routine activity, uh, functions. You take the overall profit and you try to allocate them to each party based on contribution. Now this can be a very, very subjective exercise because you need to work out the weightings each party has contributed to the project, and then you split it based on that weightings. Uh, this is often uh, the main challenge that you will have with the tax office uh, to, to get them to accept your weightings. There will be, the main discussion will be on the weightings. Um, and then that, again, that is, that is the challenge of profit split uh, in general anyway. So that is the contribution analysis. Um, I think that sort of give you a quite good overview of what a profit split method is. Um, maybe now we, we move into the, the more popular one, um, the transactional net margin method. We have an internal joke um, in, uh, running along recently. The TNMM is the Olympic gold medalist of uh, in the TP world in a way that they are always picked. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, they are all. Correct. Yeah. So just in the eyes of the tax or in the in the eyes of the tax authority, TNMM is the gold medalist, and we will see mm -hmm. why. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. So just to give you to give you a background, the first two years of me working in transfer pricing, all I do is TNMM. Um, so you will see how how often I um, this one will be used. Okay. So anyway, transfer uh, TNMM method. It's um, like I say, it's most commonly used transfer pricing method. Uh, I would say globally, uh, it involves analysis on a net profit level, meaning your EBIT level, and then before interest and tax. Uh, it can be done in three broad, broad categories. You can, you can, it can be done on a single transaction basis. What that means is, for example, you have, you, you, you have a your business is in selling cars. You can test. Uh, you can work out your net profit on each car you sell so basically transaction by transaction um, or you can do it an aggregation of transaction basis what it means is uh, for example you you have a multiple business division you are uh, you you sell cars at the same time you provide servicing to your customer so you can have i will group up my car sales as one division and i will group up my services as one division and then you test it based on that and then lastly you have the whole of entity basis. This is basically just to look at your net profit uh, or your performance uh, of the whole company at the end of the year. Okay. Now, each meta, each category have their specific uh, sort of time that is appropriate to be used. Um, but generally, you will see more often will be the whole of entity basis and the aggregation of transaction basis. Uh, because basically single transaction is just too much uh, paperwork, I would say. And I think the other thing is that if you go down the track of a single transaction, then maybe you could be better off with looking at the traditional transactional methods, right? Because then you will be looking at the price itself. Um, and maybe uh, the TNMM will be a bit harder 
nevertheless. Having said that, in the trading space, you could potentially look at the full uh, operating profit of uh, a particular trade, for example. Yes, that's a that's a that's a that's a good observation. Um, so obviously, if your company has only very limited transactions during the year, maybe you have two three trades. If you are a trader, potentially mm -hmm. you can look at transaction by transaction. Mm -hmm. uh, and if it's only one trade, then it will be sort of similar to whole entity. You look at the whole company anyway. Yeah. Uh, okay. So now all this. Uh, just before that, Adriana, sorry. Oh, so, sorry. <laughs> so all this is good. But how do we measure the profitability of the company, right? Uh, we, we use something we call the profit level indicator. It's just to sort of estimate the efficiency of your financial performance of the company, depending on what business you are in. For example, we have operating margin. If this is operating margin. I'm sure most of you are aware. It's basically EBIT over sales or your net profit over sales. Uh, Basically, it just measures how efficient you are to retaining a profit over your sales after paying off all expenses. So businesses that are, that are very highly related, I uh, mean, reliance on sales generation will be suitable to use operating margin. For example, your distributor, where your profit is basically depending on how much sales you can bring in. And then you have your full cost plus, uh, full cost markup or we call it the net cost plus. Now, this is basically compare, uh, measuring how well you are in uh, retaining EBIT over your operating costs, including your cost of goods sold. Uh, now, this is the point that a lot of people might get confused with the cost plus method because they are both, they are both from a management perspective, they are both cost plus. One, from the cost plus method, you are looking at the cross level, meaning you don't include all the operating cost, salary, staff, and electricity, and all those stuff. But full cost plus markup, you take everything, all the costs up to your operate your EBIT, earning before interest and tax. So that is where the TNMM and the cost plus subtitle is quite similar. Um, then obviously, when you look at cost-based analysis, it's more relevant to you know businesses that are reliant on cost, cost management, like your service entities um, and your manufacturers. They are all very cost-driven. Um, then we have a lot of other PLIs that are not commonly used, like your return of asset or your barrier ratio. Um, this, this, this uh, PLI, they are used on a very specific situation. Um, but generally, op uh, operating margin and net cost plus is your commonly is the the most commonly uh, PLA that you will you will bump into. Okay, so now let's see, look into how you would apply the just, TNMM. Just a yeah, comment sorry. here on the on the Berry ratio. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain countries that do not advocate with the Berry ratio because it's essentially a measure on of gross margin uh, against. Uh, uh, divided by operating expenses and it doesn't really test the profitability so in Singapore and I believe in Malaysia as well um, the is meant to be used only on exceptional cases and particularly when the intermediary entity uh, buys from related party and sells from related party uh, and sales to related party, but it's not meant to be used uh, outside of those scenarios. So it has quite a limited application. And more importantly, I think tax authorities tend to not have a lot of comfort from the barrier ratio. Yep, that's right. Barrier ratio is not quite, well, it's not commonly accepted. Uh, it's only very, uh, very niche situation, like a limited risk distributor might be able to use barrier ratio. But anyway, let's look into the application of the TNMM, like for this instance, let's say for example, we have a company A, which is your head office, man, uh, a manufacturing of beauty products. They establish a company, a distributor, distributing company in Malaysia, called company B. Company B buys 100% of their products from company A and sell it to the Malaysian market. So from a TNMM perspective, how do we then determine whether or not the purchases they, they've done is arm's length. One way we can look at it through a TNMM analysis, we will look at their overall operations because remember 
hundred percent of the purchases they are from related party. So we can look at it from a whole of entity basis. Basically, it's captured everything. Okay. So say for example, they have a ten million dollars of uh, ten million ringgit of sales. They have their cost of goods sold. They have their operating costs. End up and then they end up with uh, an operating profit or EBIT of five hundred thousand. So when you work out the operating margin, they have about five percent operating margin. Now. This 5% margin on itself doesn't mean anything. We need to compare it with the market. How do we do that is we will look for similar beauty product man, uh, distributor in Malaysia and see how much they are earning. Okay, so this is usually done through a sort of what we call benchmarking analysis, uh, analysis where we identify potential comparable distributor. They are in similar um, products, they are in similar industry and how much they are earning, we work out their operating margin. If their operating margin is more or less around 5%, usually we will come up with a range between let's say three to 4% or three to 5% or three to 6%. If you are within that range, it gives you uh, a comfort that say, doesn't matter what price I have put on my purchases because my business at the end of the day is achieving what we call an arm's length return it is safe to say the purchases that I've made is sort of give me, giving uh, is it, sort of priced under uh, uh, similar to the market price because otherwise I would not have earned the same profit as independent party operating independently. Um, does okay. that make sense? Yes, thank you, Kevin. Uh, so with that, that is the five. Uh, transfer pricing methods. We have a gold medalist, as uh, Kevin have said, which is the TNMM, at least in the eyes of the tax authority. And with that, um, Hong Chuan, you wanna uh, yep. give an overview of key takeaways, then we can open for questions. If anyone has questions, feel free to put in the Q&A and we will go through them afterwards. Yep, sure. Um First and foremost, um, though the traditional method is preferred by the IRB, uh, you should always assess the strength and weaknesses of each DP method just to justify the method that you're, you're applying. Right? Um, then any changes in TP method can trigger red flag to the tax authority. So it's important that you make sure a proper assessment are performed for a change in TP method. Right? It's generally recommended that the TP method applied remains unchanged unless there are substantial changes in the business rendering a new analysis, maybe then the use of different TP methods altogether. Um, and obviously bear in mind that certain transactions will be tested generally with a particular method only due to their um, economic nature and obviously availability of the data as well. Not saying that um, it can be used for certain methods alone. I'll give an example where loans and royalties, for example, each cut method may be more appropriate depending on circumstances, right? And lastly, it's important to note that there is an ongoing tension between profit outcome versus price testing. As um, Adrian has given us that historical lesson where um, tax authorities are actually looking at profit level. Um, yeah, US they tend to do things very differently. Even the the method naming is also different. So if you look at the US regulations, this if you look at it based on the um, surprise that they use a different method. I think TNM they use comparable profit method or something. Hmm. TPM. Yeah. So they like to name their own way, their own method. So um, it's funny how we mentioned cup is preferred. But as you know, it's all about the bottom line for tax authorities, where globally, you know, this already, they like to look at the, the net level. That's where they get their income from, right? They want to tax as much as possible. So that's why they look at the net level. So if you, let's say, you use the cut methods, um, that's fine. You have, um, um, you have they may at arm's length, but then on a profitable level, you may, uh, you may be in a loss making position then you may need to reassess that. So bear those in mind um, to be prudent, to assess all methods if possible so that 
you are sort of protecting yourself at, in, at all angles so that when an RB comes in, you are able to give them the answers they want to hear so that they have no further queries um, to raise. Thank you, Hong Chuan. So with that, we can open for questions. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A. Um, so we start with one, uh, which I can read live in one minute, uh, which is, what are the consequences if tax authority do not agree with the PP method applied by the company? Yeah, I think as I mentioned earlier, even though you have applied one that you think is foolproof, I would, as we mentioned earlier, you have to go through the strength evidences for all TP methods, make sure that those are correctly rejected, right? So when IRB comes in, they do not agree with the method they use. Obviously, they want to use another method that you're not using. Then you would have that argument in place to substantiate why that TP method cannot be used reliably, so that you know that's where your defense comes from. Yeah. I think the the and and then to add to that the ultimate consequence will be that if the proposed method by the tax authority uh, has obviously a big uh, tax impact, then the, the consequence will be having to pay the uh, uh, TP adjustments plus surcharges plus penalties, mm -hmm. right? Uh, if, if they are of the view that there has to be a TP adjustment for the client. That's why it is important to do a thorough job when you're doing the transfer pricing analysis to uh, technically discard uh, properly the fourth methods that you're not using and being very comfortable with uh, not omitting or not missing a potential TP method that that maybe the taxpayer didn't see. And that's why that, as part of the transfer pricing analysis, you have to have a thorough uh, uh, analysis on the rejection and acceptance of the methodology. And as an advisor, we will always make sure that we look at these uh, very uh, in detail so we don't find any uh, or we are not blind to some or miss uh, some potential methodologies or data that it should have been applied, right? Kevin, I don't know if you have anything. Yeah, to so I, I yeah, I think like uh, like like Adriana said, it's very important to you know when when we go through the transfer pricing documentation process and select uh, down to the economic analysis section where we select the methods, it's very uh, important to you know assume all methods is applicable or five methods and go through them one by one and see whether or not you can apply it, then include the reason in your documentation and say why we cannot apply certain method. And that will then support why you are picking certain method that you apply in your TP doc. And that will help you give um, sort of a, a rational behind your approach to the IRB when they come in for question. Go straight to gentlemen. There is a couple of uh, extra questions. Uh, one is, which method is recommended for IT service providers? Um, yep, so <laughs> IT service, like not, not only IT, like generally service provider, uh, or even any transactions, before we go into the method, obviously we need to consider the other method, uh, or the traditional method first. CUP is the main one whether or not you have information that shows that your pricing with the related party is similar to the pricing third party charge. If you have that information, obviously CUP will be the, the ideal method. Then you look into cost, uh, cost plus method, which is a cost-based analysis because it's a service provider. Have a look at whether or not you can get reliable third party. Obviously you will have reliable information internally on your transaction, but can you get reliable data externally on third-party uh, companies that will give you the same, you know, accounting characterization for your gross profit, gross profit level? Because bear in mind, cost plus method is always on gross margin. So you wouldn't know what they put in cost of goods. So you wouldn't know, um, 
you know, versus your accounting, uh, versus your accounts. So that's why generally it's a bit more difficult to use unless you're very sure mm -hmm. on, on the accounting treatment. Another one, TNMM is, again, we say that it's the o o o Olymp Olympic gold medalist. It can always be applied uh, with the TNMM um, since it's captured the whole um, net, net level operation, uh, net level profitability. There is one last question before we go in. I think it's along the lines of the same answer, yeah. Kevin, which is what is the right. preferred method for that uh, LHBN for manufacturing companies? Or IRB for manufacturing companies? Yep. So again, like I say, go through the information that you, you, you have. Do you have the party information available to you um, to use the cut method? Otherwise, consider Cost Plus or TNMM, which one, which is the more reliable data you can you can get your hands on, that will give you a better result. That is the method you should be choosing. I think in the manufacturing, uh, in the manufacturing scenario, uh, it also depends on what type of manufacturer are you. Because if you're a full fledged manufacturer, then the IRB will look at things a bit differently. If you're a contract manufacturer. And IRB will be very likely to try to test you on a whole of entity basis, um, net cost plus, but it depends on what type of manufacturer are you as well. And if yep. we're all manufacturer we discussed today <laughs> in our internal training extensively that then you're also looking at profitability. Okay, one last, uh, is 5% net cost plus markup is generally accepted by IRB for share services. Any case, are we challenged on the 5% markup? Um, unfortunately, think? IRB, yeah. Yes, go. Yeah, you go. I was going to say that we answered this in another go, go. Oh, uh, yeah. No, I was just saying that unfortunately, IRB doesn't have any safe harbor rate for these services or for respective transactions. We have, we have been trying to tablet for the IRB to actually come up with um, at least um, safe harbor rates for the low value adding services or the you know common transactions so that that would sort of ease the burden of smaller taxpayers because now smaller taxpayers are actually you know they're constrained with coming up to test the arms length uh, markup right so a lot of jurisdictions um, especially in OCD have um, have had that five percent in place for um, low value adding services. So hopefully RB you know, follows the OECD at least and then you know, apply the five percent for that. You know, like it can be reliable and reduced. And I think it also depends if the Malaysian is the service provider. Obviously, mm -hmm. IRB will always have an interest for that markup to be higher, right? Mm -hmm. So that's another consideration as well. So I think the overall answer here is that if we don't have uh, safe harbor, it would be very difficult to say uh, that is accepted. I think the best thing, the best way to be 100% sure is to do a benchmarking to test the markup, really. All right, so that with that, we are reaching to the end of our webinar. Um, we will be uh, delighted for you all to follow us on YouTube. Yes, we like transfer pricing so much that we also have a YouTube channel. And we will be having our next uh, webinar on 23rd of September. And it will be for another very interesting topic, which is intragroup loans. And I know that this is a personal favorite of Mr. Kevin Tai, who <laughs> loves that pricing. Yep. So please sign up. Uh, and uh, we will see you all in a month's time. Thank you very much for attending. And uh, it has been our pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thanks.